Uh, so the average amount of transactions per second right now, you know, I just looked at it, is about 5x where we were before the fork because more people are able to transact at these low fees. Um, that's again, kind of driven up the price a little bit. And so uh, I think right now we're seeing average fees in the like one to three cent range, um, which is still like a 10 to 20 X reduction. Hi everyone, welcome to Unchained, your no hype resource for all things crypto. I'm your host, Laura Shin, author of The Cryptopians. I started covering crypto eight years ago, and as a senior editor at Forbes, was the first mainstream media reporter to cover cryptocurrency full-time. This is the March 15th, 2024 episode of Unchained. With iTrust Capital, you can buy and sell crypto in a tax advantage retirement account. Enjoy significant tax advantages, 24-7 access, and the industry's lowest fees. Polkadot is the original and leading layer zero blockchain with over 2,000 plus developers. And the Polkadot 2.0 upgrade will be a massive accelerator for the ecosystem. Join the community at polkadot.network slash ecosystem slash community. Uniswap makes it easier and safer than ever to access DeFi seamlessly across desktop and mobile. No more clunky experiences, just clean, simple, and smart. Visit smarter.uniswap.org to learn more. Today's guest is Jesse Pollock, the creator of BASE. Welcome, Jesse. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Ethereum Improvement Proposal 4844, aka the Denkun upgrade, activated on Wednesday. What problem did the Denkun upgrade attempt to solve? Yeah, so um, Ethereum has been working to scale for the last many years. Uh, and about two and a half, three years ago, it changed its strategy a little bit. Uh, originally, the plan was to scale Ethereum by just making it so that people could do more transactions on Ethereum layer one. Uh, but then we saw the rise of these things called layer twos, uh, which run on top of Ethereum and let you run the same apps, but way cheaper. Uh, and those were organically being successful. And so Ethereum said, hey, what if instead of just trying to scale layer one, we said, hey, let's invest all of our efforts in scaling layer two and make it so many layer twos can kind of scale on top of Ethereum. We can have uh, what's called a more modular scaling strategy uh, where a lot of people can work on it together. Uh, so that kind of change happened in uh, you know 2021 or so, um, and that started a new process, basically a new new strategy inside the Ethereum community to figure out how do we make it so layer twos are cheaper. The way we kind of identified that uh, in, in 2022 was to create what you can kind of think about as an HOV or carpool lane on Ethereum, where um, there's a special kind of new resource called Blob Space, uh, where layer twos can post their data. So that when they're doing a ton of transactions on layer two, they kind of get a fast path and a cheaper path on Ethereum that lets them lower their fees. And so over the last two years, uh, we worked on this effort. It was called EIP 4844 or proto dank sharding. Uh, it took about two years of hard work across you know, the Ethereum core developers and the base team and the OP labs team. Uh, and yesterday it shipped. And what it did is it created the first version of blob space. Uh, which is that HOV lane. And then all of the rollups are right now in the process of upgrading to use blob space, which is significantly driving their fees down. And then what we're going to see over the next few years is we're going to be able to increase the amount of blob space. So what's going to kind of happen is this dance where rollups uh, lower their fees from using blob space and then people want to use them more. So more and more transactions happen that fills up blob space. And then we increase blob space because we do a new scaling improvement on Ethereum uh, that gives rollups more space. Their fees go down. Uh, they fill up again. We increase blob space again. And so this was really the first step. Uh, in what is a, a long-term strategy for making so Ethereum and the layer twos on top of it can scale to thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of transactions per second. And just to um, further elaborate for the listener, um, previously data uh, in order to verify transaction accuracy was um, stored in the more expensive and permanent call data. And so since these blobs are temporary, that is what enables these fees to go down. Yep. And one other benefit about the blobs is that they're actually also a separate pricing market than the call data. And so whereas before uh, layer twos were kind of competing with all of the other applications on layer one. So for instance, if there was a price spike and everyone was trading on Uniswap on layer one, that would drive up the fees on layer two. Now the blobs will actually have a separate market. And so that's going to mean that there's much more stability in the pricing, basically, for, for layer twos, which is going to make their fees more consistent even. 
And so since this went live on Wednesday, uh, what have you seen so far in terms of how Dunkun has helped base and other layer two rollups reduce their fees? Yeah, so we um, uh, didn't really know what to expect going in. We we'd been pretty conservative, you know, saying that we we expected uh, you know two to five x reductions in fees, um, but we didn't want to give an exact number. Uh, since we we went live, we've seen a fair amount of variation. Uh, we saw some times where we've seen thousand x reductions in fees, or five hundred to a thousand x reductions in fees, subset transactions. Uh, we've also seen actually more demands start to pick up on base. Uh, so the average amount of transactions per second right now, you know, I just looked at it, is about five x where we were before the fork because more people are able to transact at these low fees. Um, that's again kind of driven up the price a little bit, and so uh, I think right now we're seeing average fees in the like one to three cent range, um, which is still like a ten to twenty x reduction. Uh, but I think what we're going to see over the next couple of weeks is that uh, it's going to stabilize uh, at kind of this demand point. Uh, and then we're going to see more and more people start to come on chain and we're going to see more and more transactions. And what's kind of up to us is how we keep improving the scalability of both Ethereum uh, and base to make it so we can increase throughput and drive down fees. And when you say that you're already seeing increased activity on base, what types of transactions are people doing or what is this enabling them to do that previously they were maybe priced out of? Yeah, I mean, all sorts of things. You know, we're, we're seeing USDC uh, sends be way cheaper and, and people doing more of those. We're seeing NFT minting be way cheaper and people doing more of those. Uh, we're seeing trading on things like Uniswap and perpetual exchanges be way cheaper and pe people being do doing more of those. And so I, I think... You know, we didn't really know how much kind of induced demand there would be as a result of this. But I think particularly right in this moment, because everyone's so excited and base was really, I think, one of the first out the gate in terms of showing how much lower fees would actually be. It's kind of created this groundswell of energy around base. And a ton of people have bridged to base for their first time. Uh, they started trading. They have started using it as kind of a, a home for their money. And I think that that's leading to a lot of increased demand across the board. And so when you look kind of like across the spectrum, not just at base or other layer twos, but Ethereum itself, how do you think we'll kind of see like the transactions um, maybe differentiate across the different layers? Like what do you think will be reserved for layer one versus layer twos, et cetera? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the way we think about layer one is that it's it's going to end up being mostly kind of settlement. And so I think the what that means is that layer twos are obviously going to be a big user of layer one. They're going to be kind of bringing Ethereum from layer one. They're going to be posting their data to layer one. Uh, they're also going to be doing interoperability between each other through layer one in many cases. Uh, and so I kind of think about layer twos as a business uh, that is buying block space and services from layer one Ethereum. And I think we'll see other businesses as well. And so when businesses have you know, really high liquidity needs or they want to be doing cross-chain settlement where they're moving assets between different kind of economic zones that are roll-ups or L2s, um, I think they're going to be using that for Ethereum. And so I, I think we're moving much more towards a world where Ethereum is really a, a business chain. Um, and the primary consumers of it are other businesses in the form of rollups uh, or in the form of kind of large economic actors who are using Ethereum to move large amounts of money or transact with large amounts of money. I think layer two uh, is going to be kind of the general purpose user focused context. Uh, so when we're talking about onboarding billions of people on chain, which is kind of the base vision, uh, we expect that the vast majority of those people will onboard directly to layer two. Uh, and they will primarily experience layer two because it's going to be fast, it's going to be cheap, it's going to be decentralized, and it's going to be this global economy that they can actually participate in. Uh, and so I think that's what's going to happen at layer two is it's really going to be a place where everyday people transact. I, and then I think the, the last thing that we're going to start seeing is the rise of layer three. Um, and this is something that you know can, can sometimes be hard to wrap your head around, but the easiest way to think about it is today there are um, millions, billions, trillions of servers running all around the world where people are running the applications that power the internet. But none of those applications are really deeply connected to this new on-chain economy that's being built. But what's going to happen over the next few years is that um, the on-chain economy is going to grow faster and faster. And things like assets, you know, USDC or Ethereum and identity, i.e. your actual wallet and all of that history and, and kind of uh, context that comes with it are going to become really, really valuable for application developers. And so what they're going to want to be able to do is they're going to want to be able to run their great applications, but have them deeply connected with the on-chain economy. And that's what an L3 is going to enable. It's basically going to let people have their own dedicated server where they can write any kind of application. They can power their whole backend. 
but it will just plug right in to base or other layer twos. And so if they want to say, bring USDC into their application, it's as easy as that, or they want to use someone's identity, it's as easy as that. And I think that's going to lead to this rise where we have, you know, millions and billions of layer threes that are really just kind of servers that are deeply connected into the on-chain economy and gradually start to actually uh, kind of replace the existing web two compute offerings that we see uh, that we've seen the rise of over the last couple of decades. So in a moment, we're going to talk about some of the criticisms of Den Kuhn, but first a quick word from the sponsors who make this show possible. Polkadot is the original and largest layer zero blockchain with over 2000 plus developers. The anticipated Polkadot 2.0 upgrade will be a massive accelerator for the ecosystem, upgrading the infrastructure with eight times higher transaction throughput and twice as fast block times, tailored core time for the needs of every protocol, trustless bridges to multiple chains, and revised tokenomics with a token burn to reduce inflation. Perfect for GameFi and DeFi to build, grow, and scale. Get your Web3 ideas to market fast. Think big, build bigger with Polkadot. Join the community at polkadot.network slash ecosystem slash community. The Uniswap protocol is the largest decentralized exchange with billions of dollars in weekly volume across thousands of tokens within the Ethereum ecosystem. But Uniswap is more than just a protocol. Uniswap Labs builds tools to help users swap smarter with easier, safer, self-custody products that provide users access to DeFi. Tap into Uniswap's market-leading liquidity from their world-famous web app, mobile wallet, and coming soon, the Uniswap browser extension. No more clunky experiences, just clean, simple, and smart. Visit smarter.uniswap.org to get started. Back to my conversation with Jesse. There are some critics that say that having Ethereum rely on layer twos by third parties to scale could put Ethereum at risk in some fashion. Um, you know, basically it would push the general purpose computation off Ethereum to the layer twos. And that also results in a little bit of a fragmented ecosystem. And they also point out that these layer twos are more centralized, which compromises kind of the trustless nature of blockchains. What do you think of these concerns? Yeah, you know, I think when Ethereum uh, decided to kind of focus on this layer two or roll up centric scaling strategy, um, it was a big strategic decision. I, and the thing that it really prioritized in many ways was decentralization. It was saying, hey, we're not going to solve it all if we just try and do this ourselves. Um, we're actually going to be less successful versus if we bring in more people to help solve this problem with us. And that's what they've done with layer twos. Uh, they basically said, hey, we're going to open up Ethereum as a platform. We're going to attract the best minds from around the world to come and scale Ethereum. And they're going to have uh, autonomy and sovereignty to do that by building on layer two, while still depending and integrating with Ethereum by depending on layer one. And I think what we've seen in the last couple of years is that strategy has been incredibly successful. Uh, you look at the um, caliber and scale of Ethereum developers today, uh, and it's way further than where we were a few years ago. Um, you look at the consistency with which Ethereum is shipping, uh, and it's way more reliable, way higher throughput than where we were a few years ago. And I think if you look at the quality of the teams that are building on Ethereum, uh, you have people like Coinbase, uh, you know, large Fortune 500 company that said, hey, we're going to actually start dedicating significant engineering resources to scaling Ethereum. And I don't think that that would have been possible if Ethereum hadn't embraced this kind of decentralized, modular, open strategy where they said, hey, come build with us, come build together, and we can accomplish more together than we could accomplish alone. So I think that's the kind of philosophical decision that Ethereum's made. And I think it's been very successful thus far. Now, are there room for improvement? Absolutely. Um, yes, rollups have to decentralize more. Uh, and we're making really great progress with that. Uh, Base is working towards becoming a stage one decentralized rollup, which is a huge milestone. Uh, we're really confident that's going to happen this year. And how do you define stage one decentralized rollup? Yeah. So stage one is basically when you remove a bunch of training wheels. Uh, and so that includes us kind of moving to use a, a much more decentralized security council for upgrades, as well as having uh, live fault proofs. Um, uh, which are actually just going live on testnet in, I think, a few days uh, with the kind of like basically production ready implementation. And so that's going to be a huge milestone for base uh, and the rest of the super chain. Um, beyond there, I think we have a clear path to stage two, which is kind of when we remove all those training wheels and it basically inherits the decentralization of Ethereum. And so I, I think if we were saying, hey, we're five, 10 years away from having that level of decentralization, that'd be a problem. That's not where we're at. 
Instead, we're months, quarters, uh, uh, maybe a couple years away from being all the way there. So, so that's on the decentralization side. I think we're making really good progress. I think the other critique that you hear is kind of this interoperability question of how do we make it so that for the everyday user, it's super smooth to transact across all these different layer twos. Um, and I think we're also making a ton of progress here. Uh, this is actually one of the reasons why Base decided not to build our own technology stack and instead build on the OP stack. Uh, which is this open uh, public good that Base is built on and OP Mainnet is built on and Zora and Mode and a bunch of other chains are built on. And the goal with that uh, and the goal with other uh, infrastructure we're building like the Security Council is to make it so that these chains increasingly feel and operate like one chain to the user. Uh, and we have, uh, I think, really good progress that we're making in that direction uh, at the chain layer. And then we're also seeing really good progress at the UX layer, where I think from an application perspective, uh, increasingly people aren't even thinking about the chain. They're just transacting and it's using the balance wherever they have money uh, and everything just works. So I guess all that to say, um, it was a big bet from the uh, kind of strategy perspective. I think it's paying off strategically in terms of the talent, the velocity, the motivation uh, that we have in the ecosystem. And then the two big challenges that we have around decentralization and interoperability, I think we're making really good quarter over quarter progress with. And we'll see that over the next year or so, uh, a lot of those challenges that people see today really disappear. And so just so I understand, when you talked about how Base chose the OP stack, this is kind of that vision of the super chain. And there's um, a bunch of different communities that are using a similar tech stack. But then so for others that are on a different tech stack, other rollups, um, you were saying that then additionally, you guys are all working on interoperability to address that fragmentation issue. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think I think that this will end up being kind of concentric circles where, you know, maybe in the super chain, we'll have the highest levels of interoperability. Um, and so you can basically just treat it literally like one chain. Whereas for another layer two that's built on a different technology stack, you might get atomic composability, but you might not get fungibility of assets across them. And so that's going to still be a huge amount of interoperability. We're going to be able to build abstracted experiences, but it's going to have slightly different security characteristics that might impact developers. And so I think one of the benefits that we get from all of us building on Ethereum uh, is that it's this context. Uh, and we actually have a, a kind of leadership team on Ethereum that's saying, hey, we really care about interoperability. And they're working on things like base sequencing, which can make interoperability work much better. They're working on things like uh, having a native ZK prover in the layer one that can actually make it so all of these chains are using the same context for proving. And that might take a little bit of time to get all of that integrated at the layer one. But I think we're going to make progress at layer two uh, in terms of proving out those solutions, showing kind of how valuable interoperability can be, uh, and building the first concentric circles that will gradually become more and more tightly integrated over the next few years. So there were several other features that were included in this Dencoon upgrade. There were eight total. I'm not going to have you run through all eight of them, but are there any particular ones that you'd like to call out as notable? Yeah, I, I think two ones that um, really stood out to me that, that we're excited about. Um, one was EIP 1153, uh, which is what's called transient storage, uh, which is is it's basically a developer tool that lets you um, set a value at in a transaction in a block and have that value be persisted for the whole block, but not kind of saved in perpetuity. And so that allows many transactions in a single block to coordinate through this kind of transient value. The, the really big, uh, I think, new use case that that's going to enable is actually Uniswap v4. Uh, Uniswap v4 is the next generation of the Uniswap protocol. It is built using transient storage because it was too expensive without transient storage to actually, actually implement it. And it opens up a, a really big design space in terms of uh, people building on top of Uniswap. Uh, and so I'm already in touch with a large number of teams that are building on top of Uniswap v4 using hooks uh, and transient storage enables that. So I think we're going to see uh, over the next, you know, five, six months, uh, a ton of innovation around decentralized exchanges driven by transient storage and the kind of new design space that that opens up. The other one that I'm really excited about is uh, I think it's EIP 4788. Um, and it basically uh, includes the block header in the state of the block. Which, uh, maybe that's not even the right way to say it. But the, the thing that it enables for layer twos like base uh, is you can actually get much um, cheaper uh, ability to reference data on layer one in layer two. So you can use EIP 4788 to basically say, hey, we're going to, in an L2 transaction, uh, prove something about a transaction that happened on layer one. 
And so you could say, hey, only if X happened on layer one, will we allow this transaction to go through? Or only if, you know, there's certain people who hold an NFT on layer one, will we let them participate in this mint on layer two? And that opens up a huge amount of composability between the L1 data and the L2 transactions. And I think it's also going to enable a lot of this interoperability functionality that we're talking about, because not only can you prove information about layer one, you can also now prove information about layer two because other layer twos are posting their state to layer one, and now other layer twos can reference it. And so I think both 1153 and 4788 have really kind of opened up the design space for developers building on layer two and layer one. And we're going to see a ton of new use cases over the next six months that leverage that new technology. Right before we started recording, we were talking about how you would just accomplish this big feat after working for a few years on something. And then you said... Oh, but, you know, the work continues. So where are you going to be focusing next uh, when it comes to, you know, Ethereum's roadmap and scaling? Yeah, I mean, the, the one of the base team's motto is, is uh, borrowed from Kobe, uh, you know, rest in peace, Kobe. Uh, and it is the job's not finished. And every time we hit a milestone, that's kind of the mantra that we say to ourselves, like the job is not finished. And that's because our job will only be finished when we have brought the entire world on chain into a new global on chain economy that increases innovation, creativity and freedom. And so, you know, the way we feel this morning as we woke up post blobs and post Dancun is the job's not finished, head down, get back to work. Uh, A few things that we're really focused on this year. um, One is obviously continuing to drive down fees. Uh, my uh, high level assessment is at this point, we've made a ton of progress on the kind of data availability cost, which has been about 90 to 95% of the costs for uh, layer twos. What's going to happen now is now that the data availability costs are way lower, we're going to see more demand, which is actually going to increase the throughput on layer twos and increase execution costs. Uh, and so now our kind of scaling focus is turning to how do we increase throughput? Uh, and how do we reduce execution costs for, for layer two transactors? Uh, we have a bunch of things we're working on there. Uh, I think we're going to make really great progress this year. So that's kind of on the scaling front. It's how do we increase in execution throughput? The, the next thing that's very top of mind for us is how do we make smart wallets the default? This is uh, something that we think is really critical uh, if we want to enable the next billion people to come on chain. Uh, today, wallets are too complex. Uh, they're scary for everyday users. Uh, They take way too long to set up, and they're really limited in terms of what developers can do with them. With smart wallets, you can get a user set up in less than 10 seconds without an app or an extension. You can uh, have much better security uh, that actually can replicate what we all get from a bank account, but have it be fully on chain in terms of trust and security. And then we can actually enable developers to build next generation experiences with things like totally gasless transactions, where they can subsidize the fees and the user doesn't even have to worry about it. And so the base team has kind of made this a strategic pillar for us in 2024. It's make smart wallets the default. Um, We supported Coinbase a couple of weeks ago in launching their smart wallet. I think that's a huge step forward in terms of how quickly we're going to be able to get people on chain. Uh, And we're also working with tons of ecosystem partners to make it so anyone who's building with smart wallets can get started for free. Uh, You can go to basically any account abstraction uh, infrastructure provider today, and you can get up to five ETH worth of gas credits from base that we funded. So if you're building with smart wallets, you can get started building for free. So that's the second big thing that we're we're focused on. Uh, And then I'd say the third thing that that we're working on is just how do we support developers to build more great products? Uh, At this point, I feel like we've solved the three, or not solved, but we've made enough progress and 10x improvements on the three big challenges, fees, identity, and wallets. And so what remains is supporting developers to build applications that millions and then tens of millions and hundreds of millions and then billions of people want to use. And so every day, um, I spend all of my time talking to builders, uh, when of course I'm not talking with you, to actually make it happen, like actually support them in uh, building the next generation of applications. While I have you here, I know that you're a proponent of this word on-chain, and I think you like to use it as a substitute for the word crypto. Can you talk a little bit about that? Why is that? Yeah. So um, I, we, you know, I've been working in the industry for uh, 11 years, and it has um, uh, been a kind of a journey of seeing different words get uh, uh, tried and, and you know blow up and then get kind of lambasted. Um, we've gone through blockchain, we've gone through Bitcoin, we've gone through crypto, we've gone through Web3. Uh, and I think in the last year and a half, uh, our team has seen uh, the rise of a new word, on-chain. 
Um, and, and where on-chain comes from is kind of the analogy with online, uh, that we had this transformation that happened in the early 2000s where the whole world came online. Uh, and it originally started as on dash line and no one knew what it meant. People were like, oh, what's that online thing? And then gradually more and more of our world moved onto this new platform. People grokked it and it became a part of kind of our day-to-day -day existence. We think that the same transformation is happening right now with on-chain. And also on-chain started as on dash chain. We've now simplified it to just on-chain, one word. Uh, and I think what we've seen from both kind of uh, consumer research as well as kind of our data and anecdotal experience is that people really immediately grok on-chain because they can draw that analogy to online. And the thing that I think is really powerful is instead of uh, hearing crypto or Web3 and thinking about speculation and you know pump and dump and all of this kind of legacy of the crypto industry that has really been driven by speculation for the last decade, um, people here on chain, uh, they get to see it in a new light. They get to analogize it to online, which is this thing that has transformed their lives over the last 20 years. And they see it first and foremost as a technology chain. They say, oh, if I come on chain, I can earn more money for my business. Or I can cut out the middlemen who are taking my creative work and profiting off it. Or I can play this new game uh, that wasn't previously possible. Or I can collaborate and send money to anyone anywhere in the world instantly and for free. Those are not about speculation. It's not about making more money. It's about taking a technology and making your life better. And I think that is the theme of on-chain. On-chain is about upgrading our systems. It's about acknowledging that uh, a lot of the stuff we've been doing with money is built on systems that are 50 to 100 years old. And if we use technology, if we use software, if we use these blockchains to build new experiences and to bring the world on chain, we actually make everyone's life a lot better. And so that's what on chain means to us. When we've talked to everyday people, both developers uh, and users, both crypto natives and, and you know, crypto beginners, they get it too. And when they hear that word, that's the thing that lights up in their brain. So our kind of mantra for the industry is it's time for change. Uh, and it's time for us to embrace this new language, the language of on-chain that really centers crypto as a technology change that is upgrading our systems to make the world a better place. All right, Jesse. Well, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on Unchained. Thanks so much. Don't forget, next up is the weekly news recap, today presented by Unchained contributor Megan Christensen. Stick around for this week in crypto after this short break. Did you know you can buy and sell crypto with tax benefits in an individual retirement account? iTrust Capital makes this possible. But what does this mean? When you buy crypto outside an IRA, like on an exchange, you face taxes on gains. But in an IRA, like a Roth IRA, gains can be tax-free. iTrust Capital also has some of the lowest fees in the industry and 24-7 accessibility. Start now and maximize your retirement savings with iTrust Capital. Welcome to this week's Crypto Roundup. This week, Ethereum completed its Dankin upgrade, Bitcoin blasted past its all-time high, and the success of US-traded spot Bitcoin ETFs has driven some issuers to make adjustments to remain competitive. A Bloomberg ETF analyst turned more bearish about potential spot ETH ETF approvals, plus legal updates for some crypto heavyweights and much more. Thanks for tuning in. This episode was written by Brandy Betts and edited by Jeannie Kim. I'm Megan Christensen. Let's jump in. The much anticipated Dinkin upgrade has led to a significant reduction in transaction fees on Ethereum Layer 2 networks. The Dinkin upgrade went live early on Wednesday after it activated on the Ethereum mainnet at epic height 269568. The upgrade introduced the highly anticipated proto dank sharding functionality via EIP 4844, which integrates off chain, quote, data blobs, end quote, that decrease the costs associated with storing transaction data. Ethereum Layer 2 networks, which are designed to provide a faster, cheaper route to executing transactions on the underlying blockchain, were the biggest beneficiaries of the upgrade. In the first day after the upgrade, median transaction fees had dropped to 0.05 on Optimism, 0.064 on Base, 0.5 on Arbitrum, and 0.16 on ZK Sync Era. So far, Optimism and chains based on Optimism's tech stack, such as Base, have seen the biggest reductions in fees. After the strong debut of the spot Bitcoin ETFs, investor attention turned toward when spot Ether ETFs might soon receive regulatory approval. The SEC has a May 23rd deadline to make a final decision on the first of the spot ETH ETF applications. However, Bloomberg analyst Eric Balhunas revised his estimate downward of the likelihood of an SEC approval in May. 
he now wagers a 35% chance of an approval by the deadline, compared to his projection in January of a 70% likelihood. Dalhun has said that while the probability is halved, it is not zero, and an approval may still happen in the long term. Other experts, including James Seifert and Jake Chervinsky, chief legal officer for the Valiant Fund at Gold Valhunis, noting minimal activity from relevant parties and concerns about the SEC's apparent reluctance to engage in necessary discussions for approval. Issuers are adjusting fees and launching spinoffs amid the booming market for spot Bitcoin ETFs, which have collectively amassed over $55 billion in assets under management within two months of their launch, signaling a positive shift in Main Street investor sentiment, as well as market dynamics within the cryptocurrency space. Fanek has cut the fees to zero for its spot Bitcoin ETF, with the ticker HODL opting to waive management fees entirely for a year. The move was a strategic response to a competitive market that has been dominated by BlackRock's iShares spot Bitcoin ETF. And it worked. The fee reduction spurred a surge of investment, with HODL experiencing a record-breaking $119 million in inflows on the day following the announcement. Meanwhile, Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, which has experienced outflows partly due to its comparatively higher fees, filed with the SEC to create the Grayscale Bitcoin Mini Trust, a spinoff that would offer a lower cost alternative to its flagship product. GBTC has seen outflows of over $11 billion since its conversion into an ETF. In a significant legal development, the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York has rejected motions from Genesis and Gemini to dismiss a lawsuit filed by the SEC. The SEC alleges that the two crypto firms offered and sold unregistered security products through the Gemini Urine program. Judge Edgardo Ramos, presiding over the case, ruled that the SEC's complaint was plausible enough for the case to continue to court. The Gemini Earn program, at the heart of the case, promised retail customers up to 8% interest on tokens invested through the platform. Gemini Earn withdrawals were halted when its lending partner Genesis struggled to meet demands amid the market turbulence triggered by the collapse of FTX and Alameda research. Gemini then terminated the Earn program leading to the SEC's lawsuit alleging billions of dollars were collected from investors without adequate risk disclosures. The legal case is unfolding alongside Gemini's commitment to reimburse affected customers up to $1.1 billion as part of a settlement with the New York State Department of Financial Services, coupled with a $37 million fine for compliance shortcomings. The denial of Genesis and Gemini's motions to dismiss continues the legal confrontations between major players in the crypto industry and regulatory authorities. The SEC has also initiated legal action against crypto exchanges Coinbase, Kraken, and Binance over alleged illegal securities offerings. Notably, Binance has settled with other regulatory bodies for various violations, but its case with the SEC remains ongoing. Speaking of Binance, former Binance CEO Chengpeng Zhao, known as CZ, was ordered to surrender his passport under a modified bail bond ahead of his sentencing hearing. According to court documents filed with the U.S. District Court in Seattle on March 11th, Zhao now has to inform pretrial services before conducting any interstate travel within the United States and surrender his Canadian passport to a third party who is under the supervision of his counsel. These modifications mark the second change to Zhao's bail bond. He was previously forbidden from leaving the U.S., overturning an earlier agreement that would have allowed him to travel to the United Arab Emirates. Zhao had offered his $4.5 billion stake in Binance as a security for his return, but a judge wasn't convinced. Zhao's legal troubles stem from his guilty plea to violating the Bank Secrecy Act and failing to maintain an effective anti-money laundering program at Binance. As part of his plea deal, he stepped down as CEO, and Binance was fined $4.3 billion. Currently released on a $175 million bond, Zhao awaits his sentencing hearing, originally scheduled for February 23rd, but postponed to April 30th. In other crypto-related courtroom news, Roman Sterlingov, the Russian-Swedish national standing trial in the U.S. for his alleged involvement with Bitcoin mining protocol Bitcoin Fog, has been found guilty on charges related to conspiracy, money laundering, and operating an unlicensed money transmitting business. The verdict in the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia leaves Sterlingham facing a maximum of 50 years in prison. His sentencing is scheduled for July 15th. Prosecutors argued that Sterlingham operated Bitcoin Fog from October 2011 to April 2021, facilitating the laundering of approximately 400 million predominantly sourced from darknet markets engaged in illicit activities, such as drug trading and identity theft. The court determined that Sterlingham marketed Bitcoin Fog 
as a tool for anonymizing Bitcoin transactions to evade law enforcement, charging fees primarily to users of darknet markets like Silk Road, Agora, and Alpha Bay. The defense team had argued that prosecutors failed to conclusively prove Sterlingoff's connection to Bitcoin fog, and they questioned the jurisdictional reach of the U.S. government in an international case. Sterlingoff's attorneys planned to appeal the verdict. A UK judge has declared that the infamous Craig Wright is not Bitcoin creator Satoshi Nakamoto. Wright was sued by the Crypto Open Patent Alliance over alleged forgeries and attempts to claim he is the creator of Bitcoin. Judge James Miller made some stark declarative remarks prior to issuing his final ruling. Quote, First, that Dr. Wright is not the author of the Bitcoin white paper. Second, Dr. Wright is not the person who adopted or operated under the pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto in the period 2008 to 2011. Third, Dr. Wright is not the person who created the Bitcoin system. And fourth, he is not the author of the initial versions of the Bitcoin software. End quote. Wright's public claims of being behind the pseudonymous author of the Bitcoin white paper began all the way back in 2016 in an interview with the BBC. The veracity of Wright's claims have long been disputed by Bitcoin users, as he has never been able to provide cryptographic signatures related to addresses presumed to belong to Satoshi. And moving on to Elon. Speaking at an event at a Tesla factory in Germany on Wednesday, Elon Musk was asked, quote, when can you buy a Tesla with Dogecoin, end quote. Musk answered, quote, you know, at some point, I think we should enable that, end quote. In a video originally uploaded by ex-user, at Doge official CEO, quote, you can buy Tesla merch with Doge, which is cool. So Dogecoin to the moon, end quote. Ending things on a lighter note, nearly $690,000 in funds were raised to put the dog with hat meme on the Las Vegas sphere. Massive spherical entertainment venue with LED displays that wrap around its interior and exterior. The popular dog with hat meme features the image of a Shibu Inu puppy, sporting a pink woven beanie. Donors to the cause transferred USDC stablecoins into a multi-sig wallet controlled by five individuals. The fundraiser exceeded its target of 650000 to reach a total of 688469 within a few days. With the Solana-based meme coin associated with Dog with Hat surged along with the fundraiser to become one of the most actively traded assets on Solana-based decentralized exchanges. And that's all. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you enjoyed this recap, go to unchainedcrypto.substack.com. That is unchainedcrypto.substack.com and sign up for our free newsletter so that you can stay up to date with the latest in crypto. Unchained is produced by Laura Shin with help from Nelson Wang, Matt Pilchard, Juan Aronovich, Egan Gabbas, Shashank, and Wegger Korea. Thanks so much for listening. Unchained is now a part of the Coindesk Podcast Network. For the latest in digital assets, check out Markets Daily, five days a week, with host Noel Atchison. Follow the Coindesk Podcast Network for some of the best shows in crypto.